Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Devika Girish. I'm the co-deputy editor of Film Comment, and I am so pleased to have Leos Karax, the director of Annette, with us today. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to do a short Q&A, and then there will be time for audience questions. So hold on to your questions. Uh, thank you for joining us, Leos. And um, I actually wanted to start with the end. I'm really struck. This is my third time watching the end of the film, and I'm really struck by the last line, stop watching me. Um, why is that the note the film ends on? Mm. <laughs> That's why I should never do Q&A. <laughs> no, don't start like that. <laughs> I should do Q and Qs or Qs, Q and Ds, Q, Q, Q and doubts. Um, it came late. Uh, I thought, you know, he's alone in this cell, maybe with the spirit of Anne. And he sees this camera and he's been asking for all this attention as mm. a showman. And, you know, I thought, I, just, I don't know why I had this image of Psycho, the Hitchcock film, hmm. where Anthony Perkins at the end has a kind of ma manic monologue. It came to mind, I don't know. It was an improvisation. Hmm. All right, I'll go back to the beginning now. Um, how did the collaboration with Sparks come about? Who reached out to whom? So... Um, I knew the music since ch childhood. Uh, uh, mostly, I knew I knew what they used to do when I was a child. I, I didn't know the whole career, but I mm. knew them when I was thirteen or fourteen. I, um, do you remember I, which album you heard yeah, first? Yeah, I remember exactly. Um, I, I bought. Uh, it, I saw a cover because. Um, with a friend of mine, we used to steal records and <laughs> sell them at school. And there was a cover I liked with the two brothers, the Sparks brothers, being kidnapped on a boat. I thought this is interesting, and I bought bought it. And uh, it was called Propaganda. Mm. And it's still one of my favorite albums today. And the next one they did was called Indiscreet. And these are the two albums I really know. And I kind of listen to all my life. Mm. Uh, they, they give me joy. Um, and then I, so I used one of uh, the second, the, the Indiscreet album in the previous film I, I did like 10 years ago. And they Holy saw waters. it, they, they saw the mm -hmm. film and, and, and they contacted me. Yeah. And so when they contacted you, was Annette, with the story they uh, came to you with, the same one that we saw today? Or did you go through some iterations? No, first they came to me with another project, um, which I said no to, but then they came with like 13 songs. Some are, are in the film, some are mm. not in the film anymore. With the storyline, you know, I mean, he was a stand-up already. She was an opera singer. There was a baby. There was a conductor. Uh, so, yeah, it was kind of a basic storyline, and we had to start from there. What was the idea that you didn't make with them, the one they came to you first? Sorry, sorry. Uh, what was the first idea they came to you with that you didn't end up making into a film? Do you oh, remember? Uh, yeah. It was um, something I think they did for the Swedish radio called, uh, I forgot the title, but it, it was about the filmmaker Bergman being trapped in Hollywood. <laughs> you didn't want to do that? A musical about Bergman in Hollywood? Um, well, no. I. <laughs> I could not make, first of all, I could not make a period piece, and I could never make a film with someone called Bergman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so 
You know, I really think Annette is a remarkable vehicle for Adam Driver. I thought it was his best performance since Girls, and, you know, he's given pretty good ones in the interim, too. And it makes really good use of his sort of brooding but magnetic personality. And I was wondering how you ended up casting him, you know, when he first struck you as the right choice for Henry. Yeah, the... Um uh, I, I, I did, because we started the project like eight years ago, and at the time I had seen um, the series he was in called Girls, mm -hmm. and I, you know I thought uh, I, I I need this creature uh, <laughs> for my camera, and so we met at that time. Um, and um, he he was faithful to the project all these years. So, hmm. and um, I guess I wonder if do you saw some kind of continuity between him and your previous, if I could call him muse, Denny Lavant. I feel like they both have this kind of physicality that you make really good use of. I did. See, I mean, yeah, I did think of. And actually, you know, I've made a few films, but I've, I've always filmed only two actors before Adam, this actor, Denis Levant, and Guillaume Depardieu in, in one film. Paula X. Yeah, and I see with both of them in the very different ways. Uh, but for sure with Denis, yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, you can... If they're not moving, you can re film them as a sculpture, and if they do move, you can film them as a dancer. Um, also, they have that what I like, uh, but I don't know the word in English, so uh, they're a bit, a bit uh, monkeys, a bit like monkeys, but I love monkeys, so it's not, it's not negative. Uh, mm -hmm. To have something uh, primal, yeah. Mm. And what was it like? I know the the film is not really made in LA, though it's set in LA. Uh, it's kind of your first American film, even though it's a co-production. What was that experience like making a film about America in such in a way? It's about LA. So the. The brothers, the, the the Sparks brothers, were born in LA. They still live in LA, and they live in their bubble. You know, they, they see each other like every day for the last I don't know how many years. Um, Worth. <laughs> yeah, um, and then I started because of that. I, I started to think seriously about LA, which I know a little bit, um, but not that. Not that much. Uh, so I started to imagine what I liked was the, this huge space. You know, you, uh, I started to imagine this motorcycle and etc. But then producers get nervous with LA because it's very expensive mm. to shoot there. So they were saying, let's move it to New York or to Toronto or to Paris or whatever. But at that time, I was, I was, uh, so we, I mean, it was, What's exciting was making a film in LA without shooting in LA. So we shot in Belgium and Germany, and we shot, I think, a week in LA um, for the opening scene and, and a few other scenes. Yeah. So you recreated sort of an LA vibe in those other cities? Yeah, you know, it's a fact when you, when you do a musical, where almost everything is sung, you have such a freedom because then everything is possible. You know, you can have a puppet and you can have LA and Belgium. And, uh, so it's a real liberation, you feel. Uh, so it's exciting to, you know, to a certain degree, to have, go into the fake, the fakeness of what cinema always loved anyway. I mean, one part of cinema mm. from the origin, uh, yeah. Let's talk about the puppet. So when did you decide to 
use a puppet for baby Annette and why? Um, so uh, when there's something I don't like, which is casting, and I try to avoid it, usually what I, uh, I realize that when I imagine a film for an actor or an actress, I usually end up doing it, even if it takes one or 10 years. But if I imagine a film for no actors, I usually never find the actors. Huh? Mm. In this case, I was looking for a little girl from age zero to five who could sing beautifully, et cetera. <laughs> so I thought this project is doomed. Uh, <laughs> uh, then, of course, what solution did we have? You know, could go to um, 3D imagery, which is anti-emotional because, first of all, there's nothing on the set. It's all post-production. I didn't see myself shooting without a net on the set, without touching her or the actors being able to touch her. Mm. Or you could go into ro robotics or animatronics, but that didn't seem very uh, moving either. So the only thing left was a puppet. Uh, <laughs> but I knew nothing about puppets, but uh, I thought there must be someone in the world able to create a emotional puppet. And took time to find someone. Um, and, you know, at the very end of the film, Annette does turn human for that final scene. And even in that, I mean, that's a very young actress you have who performs in a very precocious way the kind of lines that she's saying and the pretty dark adult emotions she's expressing. How did you find her? And how did you work with her on, on that scene? Mm. Yeah, so, so, so I thought, okay, I, I found a casting, I found the man and the, the woman, and I, I found the puppet. So I, I thought I was past all the, the casting problems. Um, but then I had this idea, she's gonna come, she's gonna become alive, she's gonna be a real little girl at the end, and I thought, I'm never gonna find a, you know, a five years old. But we still did a casting in Europe and in America, and um, Actually, I took the youngest one. She just, had just turned five. And I took the one with the shortest attention span. I mean, she couldn't concentrate. She, <laughs> she, uh, but uh, each time she tried, she had the few seconds where she was wonderful. So I decided she was the one I wanted to film. And, um, and it was mostly a work, the three of us, Adam, me, and her, mm. you know, sometimes, sometimes Adam was almost directing her, sometimes I was in front of her and being Henry and, and hmm. that's how we did it. Were you able to explain to her what she was singing, that uh, now you have nobody to love? Um... I don't that, do that with any actor, you know, <laughs> big or small, you know. Um, no. Um, and, you know, I know you've said that you don't watch a lot of movies, but I feel like Annette is so steeped in film history, but also the history of other art forms like comedy, opera, literature. You have a lot of references in the credits from Edgar Allan Poe to Sondheim to Bella Bartók. Uh, what were the first images or references that came up in your mind when you were sort of conceptualizing this film? Because the film was not mine, and um, it's not my product in the beginning. Uh, usually when I start my own films, I do have one or two images, and one or two feelings, and then I try to put all that together. This time... Um, no, there was really the music and, and this this music from childhood, from my childhood, and the the the, 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 the joy of music, even if when it's mm -hmm. you know not a, it's not a happy film, but um, and then I had the only image I had was um, 
this tiny little girl, uh, like a you know, like a shining star in, in darkness, and how you know that that was my own first image. Um, mm. Then I, I was always interested in stand-up comedy, and stand-up comedian seems to me one of the hardest things to, to do. So I get m more interested in it uh, about Kaufman, Andy Kaufman, or Lenny Bruce, or um, other people, and I started to read their books and how terrifying it is to go on stage uh, having to make people laugh. I mean, it must be a nightmare. So <laughs> this whole intensity of it, and and I knew nothing about the opera, so I had to. Uh, then you you realize, you know, opera is mainly killing women so they can sing their most beautiful song. So it can be by strangulation or a knife or a, or a gun or burning them or whatever. Um, the, and then the Edgar Poe came late when I decided on this last scene, which owes a lot to Edgar Poe because it's called uh, Sympathy for the Abyss, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, something I read when I was a young kid. And Edgar Poe he describes a man who's hanging to a cliff and he knows that if he looks down, he's going to fall but he can't help looking down. And King Vidor? Well, King Vidor, because I, I use, you know, the black and white shot of the- Crowd? Of the, of, yeah, the, the film, the crowd, the audience, and, and because I've always loved King Vidor, so. All right, um, just a last question before I pass it on. What is a recent movie that you've seen that you really liked? Um, I don't see movies anymore, so... Well, what was the last one <laughs> you saw? No, I, w I wouldn't know. <laughs> because I know in 2012 you said Chronicle, the sci-fi movie, in um, a New York Times interview, and I was wondering if there was anything else you'd seen since then that you liked. Um, uh, I'll think about it then. Okay, <laughs> I'll come back to it. All right. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I believe someone will bring the mic to you. I'm not sure people know Tom Lira nowadays, but he was, I, would, I don't know if you can call him a stand-up comedian, he was a math teacher who in the late 50s, 60s, uh, did shows where he played piano and I mean, he was a comedian, singing comedian, wonderful. Uh, and my parents had the records, so when I knew him since I was a child. Uh, now he's, I think, 93 years old. Uh, and I had used a bit of his, a line or two of his in my first film when I was in 20, 22 years old. Uh, but I had, you know, I stole, stole it. Uh, but this time I asked for permission, and it's the um, it's some uh, Brotherhood Week. It's called this National Brotherhood Week. It's called it. It's a passage about um, all the Muslim hate to Catholics and all the um, Catholic hates Muslims or whatever. Uh, that's that's the passage. Yeah. Did you write um, Henry's sets? Did I what? Did you write Henry's sets? The stand-up the two stand-up sets he does? Yeah, the second one, uh, where he doesn't sing much, uh, yes. And the first one I wrote when he talks and, and some of the songs and the Sparks wrote some of the songs. So the question is if uh, Leos has any fear when he works or does he thinks I'm Leos Karak, so <coughs> this is going to work? If I think something, I think the opposite. You know, I'm, uh, I'm Leos, it's going to be fucked up. <laughs> um, but I do need chaos. I, I know that. So, uh, 
you know, um, I have to have people around me who are very good. And so between my chaos and their precision to build something, hopefully, uh, but also because I'm, I've made so few films, uh, I feel completely unable, you know. Uh, so I'm uh, getting older, I get used to that a bit. Uh, and I think anyway, a project should be impossible, you know. It, that's a basic, that's what a project should be. It, it seems that it is impossible, then you find a few people, you try to, it's a, like a bluff, you try to say, it is possible, I, I know how to do it, which is not true, and whether it's money people, or actors, a crew, you know, that's how I started, you know. I started, I had never made a film, I had never seen a camera, I had never studied cinema, and I just said, you know, I know how to do this. And, which was not true, but because I was young, I think people thought, oh, maybe, who knows? <laughs> um, they're in the back. The truth is, I, I, I don't think I make, I, I, don't, I don't think I make films um, about anything. You know, um, I wouldn't know how to do that. Some, uh, I'm not a storyteller, um, so let's say this project project is special because they, it didn't. I didn't imagine the, the beginning big beginning of it, so I, I took what the sparks, and there was this element of celebrity already there, and um, and I find it very difficult to find to film rich people, I find it difficult to film famous people. Um, and also because sparks have their own world, which they call you know, pop fantasy world with a lot of irony. And I'm against the irony, too much irony in cinema. I think it kind of kills and it can be tiresome. So I didn't, first I didn't know how, to, how am I going to show rich, successful people with the, uh, nowadays because, you know, it used to be all the time, like when Vincente Minelli made films or Douglas Sirk, a film like his, I love, but at the time in the 50s, so you could show rich people like if they were kind of, uh, they you know failed gods and a great tragedy, but today it's it's you can't do it anymore that way. So that was a problem for me. I mean, something that worried me. Um, I forgot the question. But, uh, it's the question. Uh, the question was whether the film is also about parents. Oh, the parents. Yeah. Well, first uh, I said no to the project because. Although the Sparks knew nothing about me in my life, I, I think, though they said so. You know, I had a young daughter, she was nine, and I thought, okay, you know, okay, can I, can I, is it time to do a, a film about a, a bad father? Uh, and will there be confusion in her head? But then I understood there wouldn't be. Um, but yeah, I made it. At, I think I, I try to make it more about uh, father, daughter, um, and especially by adding this last scene. Did you say that you, you're not a storyteller just now? So what do you consider yourself to be? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Uh, someone who happens to make films. <laughs> She's asking if you were trying to breach the boundary between a theater stage and a musical film. The boundary is what? What's boundary? Oh, like a theater stage um, and then a film, a musical film. I guess mix the two in some way. No, I didn't. 
No, the, um, the project in the beginning um, was more um, theater oriented, like the song So May We Start existed from the start, but it was about a, like a theater, uh, you know, people preparing for a show. Um, but I, obviously, the, the, the two performers, Adam and, and Marion, or Henry and Anne, are on stage uh, in a very different ways, but they have the same vulnerability, you say that? Vulnerability, yeah. yeah. Uh, like they're very, you know, it's very courageous to, to expose yourself that way, to, to sing, to voice is something very intimate. And at the same time, it, it's, it's like, um, it's a muscle that you've got to train. Uh, um, and as I said, having to make people laugh is, being completely naked in front of people. So I used the stage in both worlds and with this motorcycle going from one to the other, uh, trying to, and because we're in a musical where everything is unreal anyway, uh, to use this, this metaphor of the stage, let's say, as a, uh, yeah. Maybe we'll squeeze in just one short question over there. Oh, will there be more Denny Levant in Leos Carax films? <laughs> no idea. The you know the uh, Fassbender died at the age of thirty six, I think, and he made thirty two films. And I I was calculating that I would need two hundred more years. <laughs> uh, so if I can make one more. Uh, I've, I for sure I work with Denis. I don't know if it will become a film or not, but we we will do something. Yeah. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.